Welcome to Buckeyes Tomorrow Morning for Saturday, December 31st. I'm your host, Tom Moore. The Peach Bowl game against Georgia is today. The game against Michigan in 329 days. This feels like it could be one of the more consequential days in the history of Ohio State football, at least the last decade of Ohio State football. Uh, this time tomorrow, we'll either start the show by counting down to a national championship game appearance, possibly against those Michigan Wolverines, or by starting the countdown to the 2023 season opener against Indiana. I'm guessing I know what most people in the audience are hoping for, but we'll see how it shakes out. And this has been a really interesting week in Atlanta, because when you talk to folks who cover Ohio State, many of them are picking Georgia to win. And you talk to folks who cover the Bulldogs, they are really, really quick to tell you all the flaws the team has, why they think the Buckeyes have a really good chance to pull the upset. So today we're going to be trying to sort fact from fiction about this game and some of the big matchups that could decide it. My guest is Buckeye Huddle's X's and O's guru, Ross Fulton. Ross, let's start on the ground with the Ohio State offense. Uh, Georgia is first in the nation in opponent rushing yards per game, second in the country. They've allowed only five rushing touchdowns all season long, sixth in average yards per rush allowed. So, Ross, fact or fiction, Ohio State's rushing attack is going to be either a minor factor or a non-factor in this game. Fiction, because it's a it's a factor either way. Um, I mean, Ohio State has to have some semblance of a run game. I'm not arguing that they should be, um, you know, I think, on the year, they were like 50, what, 54, 5%, 56% run, to pass, uh, like 45% pass. I think those numbers should be flipped. Um, I think that Georgia's tight and mid-front makes some things, like particularly inside zone, difficult, particularly when you have Jalen Carter as the yeah, 4-I that you're trying to like solo block. Um, but I do think they need some, some semblance of a run game. Um, you know, Ohio State, it's not like they've never faced tight fronts before. Wisconsin runs it a bunch. Maryland runs it. You know, I do think that, in theory, um, you know, stretch running stretch week, which Ohio State loves to do, um, as we've talked about many times, is a good counter to, to those three-man odd fronts. Um, and I think, you know, <clears throat> with the healthy mind, Williams, I mean, there's been a lot of focus on Ohio State's run game this year, but like statistically it's been pretty good. It's there's been short yardage situations that stand out. So I do think they're gonna have to run the ball with some semblance. Um, but I do think that a lot of staying ahead of schedule has to also come out of the passing game. And you know, the passing game, Georgia is the de- Georgia defense overall against the pass is pretty good. They are thirteenth in the country in passing yards allowed per opponent attempt but they have been vulnerable to the big play. That's the one number that sort of jumps out. You know, if you look, if this was like a real stat, like a spreadsheet with stat, you know, all the different stats on it, there's a lot of green on there for all the stuff they're good at. And then this one would be bright red. They've given up 12 pass plays or 40 yards or more. That is 111th in the nation. And I know you're thinking Ohio State has been terrible against big plays in the passing game. And, you know, they kind of have. But that is actually one more than Ohio State has given up. So Georgia has given up more downfield long throws, 40 yards or more, than uh, or big plays in the passing game than Ohio State has. So, Ross, fact or fiction, the Buckeyes have an opportunity to hit a, you know, not just one or two, but maybe a bunch of really big plays through the air. Yeah, fact. I mean, they have to. <clears throat> they have to push it. I mean, I think that, you know, one of the lessons from the Michigan game should be that if you have a single coverage opportunity uh, for Marvin Harrison, you got to you got to put the ball up. I mean, you got to give him a chance to make a back shoulder play. I think that uh, they were too hesitant to do that, whether by scheme or, you know, shroud decision making. <clears throat> um, I think you got to take those shots. I mean, I I don't know. I mean, Bill Conley had some stats a couple weeks ago that I mean, they're pretty vulnerable on horizontal throws, too. Um, you know, they have a bevy of concepts. I mean, we've, you know, we could talk about cover seven for, and their man match, like principles forever, but like, you know, Will Muschamp's the defensive coordinator. He really likes playing single high coverages. If they have, they think you're going to run the football. So back to our conversation, like by running it some, you do limit what they're going to do in the back end, which gives you more opportunities to throw. Like you don't, you know, want to get in a situation that they sort of ended up in a Michigan somewhat down late where like you're getting a bunch of different two cover two looks and they're, you know, throwing the kitchen sink in terms of like schemes at you. So I I think that Ohio state has to, you know, take a page from what LSU and Alabama did use lots of spread bunch sets, run some underneath routes uh, horizontally hit some middle of the field, you know, in, in breaking routes and then take your shots and you got to hit them when they're there. 
And then on the other side of the ball, the Georgia offense feels like if you ask people just without without going and looking at stats, what does Georgia like to do on offense? You're you're probably thinking like, oh, you know, Nick Chubb, run the ball between the tackles and and really pound the ball and just throw when you have to off play action and that kind of stuff. And it is they're actually sixth in the nation in yards per carry. So they are a very efficient run game. That's almost dead even with Ohio State as well. But they will put in the put the ball in the air even more than Ohio State does in an average game. They throw it, Georgia throws it 33 times a game. Ohio State throws it 31. I would bet you could get pretty good money, uh, I, you know, betting people on that if they hadn't looked those numbers up. So, you know, with all that said, fact or fiction, Ross, it is still more important for Ohio State to stop the run first against the Georgia offense. Fact, because a lot of that, I'd love to see those pass numbers broken down by what percentage of those are screens or like, you know, reliefs to the outside bubble screens, now screens, running back swing screens. They do a lot of that horizontally that comes off the run game. And like, you know, at the end of the day, <laughs> I think that Stetson Bennett's uh, at his best when he's doing that or able to throw play action off of an effective run game. Like, you know, you'll watch them and, and he'll make a questionable decision and they'll be like, okay, we're just going to run the ball the next drive. So I think you definitely, uh, and this gets back to complimentary football. Like, I mean, you are, aided in this if you can grab a lead um but i you know i definitely think you want to uh force them to to be much more of a drop back team um especially with you know seems like lad mcconkey's status is uncertain had didn't really wasn't at practice you know if he plays i'm assuming he's not gonna be 100 percent. we've all done this dance many times with ohio state this year in terms of guys not playing not being 100 percent. sort of um seeing how that impacts effectiveness so you know, I, he's a guy they obviously really rely upon. So I think if they're if they're running the ball well, they're going to be better on offense. So I do think it still stop, starts with stopping the run, and then you have to defend the perimeter well against all those screens. Yeah, and just to give you a quick update on Lad McConkey's status, uh, Kirby Smart was asked about him at uh, the coaches head coaches press conference on Friday morning, and he said we're hoping to have him back. Him and Warren McClendon, the right starting right tackle, we're hoping to have them back. Which is like yes, that. I'm sure you are. That doesn't actually provide us any information, which I kind of think might have been the point of the whole thing. So uh, earlier in the week, he I think on Thursday at Media Days, he uh, you know he said, "Well, I'll find out together on Saturday" or something very close to those lines. So yes, uh, I think they're trying to keep things a little close to the vest. But you know, when you when you look at a passing attack like this, we're going to de- take a deviation from the the format here, and I'm just going to ask you a question: when you when you're looking at a passing attack like Georgia's, where they don't have a Marvin Harrison, they don't have you know, the one guy who is the otherworldly wide receiver or, you know, a Marvin Harrison and an Emeka Ibuka. It just kind of goes all over the field. And they've got a couple tight ends they'll throw to. They threw the, the Kenny McIntosh had over 100. One of the running backs had over 100 yards receiving in the season opener in this same building against Oregon. They just kind of spray the ball all over the field. What is more challenging to stop as a defense? The the offense where you've got the otherworldly wide receiver like a Marvin Harrison or an offense where they might throw it to 10 different guys during the course of the game. Depends how good the other people are opposite the otherworldly player. Um, I mean, I, I would still take, I would take Ohio State's position. I mean, I, I would argue that Brock Bauer somewhat falls in that category. Um, I think that like they, you know, his targets do vary and it's not like he has like a high volume game that you can point to, but I do think that on passing downs in particular, you want to, bracket him i mean i would consider him like the equivalent of a really good slot receiver um so but like you know again like we have to separate out like when you're talking about like kenny mcintosh having 100 yards again a lot of that is off of the quick screen game on the perimeter and to me that's just an extension of playing the run like you have to fit the run well you have to fit those gaps outside well also and take on you know block destruction fill the whole the same principles apply um i do think that in theory, the setup of Georgia fits into Ohio State. I mean, I, I trust Ohio State safeties more than I trust their corners, even despite the fact that some of the breakdowns against Michigan were a result of those safeties. I mean, I think you just have to count on Latham Ransom playing a better game than he did against Michigan. And again, maybe that was some of like having a broken hand and, and everyone being injured. And now you've had a month and people are going to be better off. Um but, you know, I, th- I still think that it, it allows Ohio State to have a better chance of what they want to be able to do. 
And just to let people know about Brock Bowers, just to pull, I pulled up his game log for the season. High catches on the season is six. That was against LSU. Uh, the game before that against Georgia Tech, five catches for 20 yards. But uh, against Florida at the end of October, five catches for 154 yards. So it just it, it can be a little feast or famine with him. And, you know, Darnell Washington, the other tight end who is about the size of an office building, he is, you know, they'll throw it to him once a game. And it's like, why on earth are you not throwing it? to Like, I, there's no one in America that can cover that guy. And uh, they just they don't throw it to him for long stretches of games at times. So, but they have so many other guys. So yeah, that is sort of an interesting, an interesting kind of different look for Ohio state to be facing. Um, you know, as back to the Ohio state defense, we have heard over and over and over again this week, this month about the five big plays against Michigan that cost the Buckeyes that game. When you look at Georgia's offense, Georgia's offense is not necessarily a big play offense. They had only six rushes and five passes or 40 yards or more all season. So just 11 plays of 40 yards or more all season. That's less than one per game. And just for comparison, Ohio State had 14 passes, just passes, not even rushes, 14 passes of 40 yards or more this season. So that seems like that would be okay. Georgia doesn't match up well with Ohio State's, uh, you know, one of Ohio State's potential weaknesses on defense. However, I remember saying a lot of these same things before the Michigan game, and we know how that turned out. So fact or fiction, Ross, uh, Georgia has the ability to exploit Ohio State's uh, you know, potential issues with big plays in a way that Michigan did. I mean, sure. If you, if you make the kind of errors that Ohio state made, I mean, you know, I would, I would recommend, you know, I got to get guys on the ground. If you're going to cover zero, you have to hustle to the football. If you're in cover zero and you're the underneath defender and don't, you know, I would recommend not putting your backup nickel in just, just because, um, you know, you have to keep eye discipline when sc- on scramble drills. I mean, that's when a lot of Michigan's big plays came was McCarthy scrambled, guys turned up field on routes, and, you know, Ohio State got looking in the backfield trying to play hero ball instead of, of doing their job. Um, but, you know, I I know people don't really like this answer, but, like, it is, like, big plays like that are sort of like three-pointers in basketball in the sense of, like, you can't rely on that being a thing. And that cuts both ways. Like, that was just somewhat of an anomaly and like, you know, if you play that game back, it probably doesn't happen. If you play Michigan again, it probably doesn't happen. If you play another team, it probably doesn't happen. So it, it there is some like randomness and flukiness to that. I mean, I, I think throughout the course of the season, Ohio State was pretty disciplined and executed pretty well. I, I wouldn't say they're a great pass defense no matter what. I mean, you know, Jim Knowles is willing to devote extra resources to stop the run. You know, again, Ohio State. Their hope has to be that their corners are healthy, healthier than they've been this season. Um, but, you know, I, I don't think you have to totally change who you are just because of that one game. And, and you have to just, you know, people have to play. You have to hope that some of that was like overhyping of the rivalry and guys sort of panicking and, you know, trying to do too much. And, and in a different environment, they'll, they'll play more like they did the rest of the year and revert to the mean. All right, and final one for you. Georgia is among the best red zone defenses of the country. They give up touchdowns on just 32% of opponent trips down to the red zone. So fact or fiction, if Ohio State has three or more red zone possessions that end with a field goal or less, so they turn it over, they turn it over on downs, they miss a field goal, they kick a field goal, whatever it is, three or more times, Ohio State loses this game. That's, that's my, that is my working theory here. If they're kicking field goals or failing in the red zone, that's going to be what gets them. So is, is that fact or fiction? That's fact. I guess if you are three for three on field goals, maybe you can survive that. But I don't I agree with you. I mean, I've seen too many situations this year where, you know, opponents have had success against Georgia. And, I, you know, I would extend it out to short yardage as well. Anything inside of Georgia territory. Um, you know, there are several drives against Michigan where Ohio State drove and, and came up empty, whether because of making poor strategic decisions to punt or, you know, not converting. So they need a better, they need a plan. Um, I mean, I think do think some of it is hitting explosive plays where you don't get in those situations. Um, but, you know, they need to be better in the low, you know, I don't think they've actually been all that bad in the low red zone. I think they've executed pretty well, uh, but certainly short yarders than they have been this year. And, you know, as I said in my article, uh, you know, discussing what Ohio State's game plan on offense should be, I think it is probably some combination of heavy personnel, um, 
you know, and then in those high leverage situations, you know, go to Harrison, like don't, don't rely as much on your third or fourth options. Like you got to come up with ways similar to like they did against Iowa in those fourth downs or, or, you know, they shroud sprinted out and to set up Harrison on, on comeback routes. Like you need a plan to get him the ball. You cannot not throw to him once when you're inside the red zone, et cetera. All right. So let's get a score prediction from you. We did our staff score predictions. Those will be out by the time this, uh, this goes up. What did you what did you predict and why? I, I said Ohio State thirty six thirty two, and I don't know. Maybe I've just over over analyzed this to death, or maybe I'm just reacting to to all the negativity out there. To be frank about Ohio State, but I, I, you know, this I, I may eat these words, but like when I when I watch Georgia, they are an excellent coach team. Jalen Carter is a great player. Bauer is a very good player. Beyond them, I don't see like great players. I mean, I think like Starks will be. But he's a freshman. I see a very well coached team um, that executes well, and so you're going to have to match that. But I don't see 2020 Alabama or 2016 Clemson in terms of the top end talent. And so I am banking on the fact that Ohio State. The injuries were much a bigger factor for them in the last month of the season than uh, anyone could know. And that's not even just guys being out. That's guys like Ameka Buka getting healthy and Denzel Burke getting healthy and Kate Stover. And I think that, you know, history has proven that uh, oftentimes a loss is the best thing that helps a team in college football. It's just hard because it's hard to take a loss and, and keep going. And so Ohio State is in that situation. And so, you know, I think they can jump out to a lead and, and put Georgia a little bit behind the eight ball. And, and uh, I think they'll be more aggressive than they've been this entire season. All right. Well, we will find out if you uh, if you are right. I think people, probably the majority of the audience would be uh, happier if your predict- uh, score prediction came true than mine. But uh, we will uh, we will all find out together Saturday night in Atlanta, uh, at 8 p.m. kickoff. Boy, this game, if it's a long one with TV commercials and all that kind of stuff, you, there's a way this uh, stretches into 2023. So uh, could be a could be a late night in, in Atlanta, but uh, should be should be quite a football game. So uh, thank you guys all for joining us. Make sure you check out all of our uh, all of our coverage at BuckeyeHuddle.com, including Ross's article, as he mentioned, talking about Ohio State's offensive game plan. We will have our uh, pregame show coming up. On Saturday afternoon, we're going to do that before the other semifinal game starts. Um, I think the plan was two o'clock, but we'll uh, make sure you're just subscribed to our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash Buckeye Huddle. Uh, we'll have our usual pregame show for a couple hours. And then uh, as soon as that clock hits zero, we will have all of our postgame coverage. And boy, is that going to go one of two ways. I am genuinely fascinated to see how this game plays out. But either way, there's going to be a whole lot to talk about. So we'll see you after the game as well at, Buckeye, at youtube.com slash Buckeye Huddle. Thank you guys all for joining us. Have a great day. We'll talk to you tomorrow.